For the first time, the U.S. is holding a Pacific Island Country Summit. This comes after a recent increase in China's outreach to Pacific nations. Kiyoki Jackson is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for MITRE's National Security Sector. Kiyoki, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. What is uh, China's partnership strategy when it comes to alliances? Mimi, it's a great question. And I think we should be clear that uh, while the U.S. has allies uh, in general, China has clients. And if you look at their strategy, they're basically making investments through the One Belt, One Road and similar initiatives to be able to put in place influence. And what that leads to then often is control, uh, particularly over technology and critical infrastructure, as well as strings attached, like having to allow basing of Chinese forces. So that's very much China's strategy. Our strategy needs to combat that. I was going to ask you about our strategy. We, we've got a, a distance disadvantage because we're not there. So how should the Pentagon respond? Well, the reality is for many, many years, decades, uh, the U.S. and countries like Australia and New Zealand have been some of the biggest partners and allies to nations in the Pacific. Uh, so we need to reinvigorate those alliances. And there's a few things that we can do. We need to recognize that there are real and deep needs, and we need to be listening intently to what those needs are. We need to demonstrate consistent and sustained partnership, and that's things like capital investment, humanitarian aid, and clearly security assistance, uh, including things like cyber capacity building. And this is when you say operationalize the alliances, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, we have, we need to realize that we are being put to a very public test today. We're out there with things like our Indo-Pacific strategy, the AUKUS agreement, that's Australia, UK and United States, uh, the Quad and the an Indo-Pacific economic framework for partnership. So now we need to dis actually demonstrate real results. When I talk about interoperability on the military front, that means showing that our systems, our practices, our processes are interoperable in a joint and allied way. We need to show that in things like exercises, and we need to demonstrate our resolve. You know, the U.S. is a democracy. China is not, not to state the no. obvious. But when it comes to modernizing weapons and systems, is the U.S. at a disadvantage? So China does have some advantages. Clearly, with a totalitarian system, they are able to direct and marshal the resources of the entire government and their entire private sector. Uh, we need to recognize that the U.S. has some very strong advantages as well. We've demonstrated over many decades that our system is adaptive and it really rewards innovation. We have a free market system, a free market economy that rewards creativity and promotes growth. And so those advantages have pro proven to be sustained and enduring over time. We also have a very long acquisition cycle. Yes, we do. That they so, don't have. So clearly we need to be able to go faster. But one thing that I'll emphasize is we also need to drive whole of nation solutions. And so yes, we need to drive military modernization. I'll give a couple of examples for countering China. Uh, the first is demonstrating true joint all domain operations in a sustained operational environment, including simulated contested environments that are applicable to the Indo-Pacific. The other is, of course, modernizing our strategic deterrent, investing in our nuclear triad, and especially modernizing our nuclear command, control, and communication systems that underlie that deterrent. And, and you, you say that that's important, that whole, whole of nation thinking. Um, are we not doing that right now? We do it, but there is clearly room for systematic improvement. And I'll highlight a few areas. The first is just holistic situational awareness. We need to have a real data-driven set of insights into how China is competing systematically against us. And that's not just militarily. They also have aspirations to dominate economically, dominate in technologies and industries of the future, and, dem and uh, dominate diplomatically as well. China has been watching the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. What are the lessons that they're taking from the invasion, from how uh, Russia has executed the war, and from the world's reaction to it? Yeah, China has very clearly been watching closely. They've been watching very closely how the United States and our allies have partnered together and the strength and resilience of our response. They are watching very closely to see what a determined population with a resolute leader and modern capable arms can do against an invading force. 
But we've been watching pretty closely too, and we're learning. And so first of all, we have seen the effectiveness of this concerted allied response, and we need to continue to engage in that way. We've also seen some of the limitations of things like sanctions, particularly as you look at this so-called friendship without limits between China and Russia. So those are not distinct problems. But I will say this, we need to demonstrate deterrence and make integrated deterrence very visible. And there's three ways that we're going to do that. One is that integrated holistic situational awareness that we talked about so we can actually craft whole of nation coordinated responses. The second is integrating heavily with our allies and partners and showing that in, a, in true operational scenarios, both economically and militarily. And the third way is really emphasizing how we can bring those whole of nation responses, not just through our defense establishment, but through organizations like commerce, treasury, and law enforcement. MITRE is an FFRDC. It's a federally funded research and development center. Um, briefly spell out what that means and your role in influencing government policy. Yeah, so a federally funded research and development center, these are private enterprises, but they're not for profit and chartered by the U.S. government. MITRE actually is not an FFRDC per se, but we operate six different FFRDCs for national security and the intelligence community, for homeland security, commerce, transportation, treasury, and others. And so that gives MITRE actually a unique perspective across both the national security and public sector areas of our government. FFRDCs give unfettered access to the government to technology, systems engineering, and mission domain expertise that they don't typically get within government or the for-profit private sector. So when I talk about whole of nation, MITRE is actually deeply engaged in all of these areas of strategic competition across government. We're modernizing the nuclear deterrent. We're preparing for the next cyber threat. We're readying the nation for the next um, uh, uh, biosecurity threat. And so that's what we mean by solving problems for a safer world. All right. Kiyoki, thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.